Hello, everyone, and welcome to the July uh, 2019 licensed staff meetings. I'm glad that you guys are able to view this. And as a reminder, um, this is only allowed or offered for you four times per year, which um, again, thank you for coming. As a reminder, uh, you need to attend 12 meetings per year. Um, oh, sorry, it's not in person. I should have corrected that. Um, eight of them are in person. Um, and four of them are allowed to be viewed on Healthcare Academy. I track this, I send out um, care forms. Um, you have one week to review the recording once it's posted, and then you know we go from there. This is super important that you guys are doing this just because we need to be able to keep everybody accountable for the meetings, and we also need participation. So if you could um, plan ahead and look at when the meetings are scheduled, and then make sure that you can be at the meetings live, that would be um, for your benefit. Budget and census, this has been something that's come up quite a bit lately. Um, as many of you know, our census has been lower. We have had up to 30 beds open at one time, which is very, very scary, um, but it also makes us have to adjust our staffing throughout the building. Lee and Rachel, they watch this every day and they adjust to meet the needs of each neighborhood. So when there's call-ins, please work together and figure out, okay, who has more openings and who doesn't, and um, really communicate and work together so that you guys are able to figure out a compromise as nurses that best suits our residents. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that we've had to kind of decrease the hours, but you'll probably see more of us as leaders, leadership doing, um, taking more unplanned time off because we want to be able to not jeopardize the level of care or the amount of staff that we have. We've had to cover some or make some changes just temporarily, but again, Remember that this is temporary. Once we stabilize, we will actually, we'll be back in our normal routine for staffing. Um, so embrace this right now with some grace, give us some grace. We're really trying hard to make sure that everybody has what they need, but also please be conscious of, of the budget as well. And if you're able to do things and work a little bit more efficiently just to be able to get out of here on time or leave an hour early, that's you know what we would like to see. The courtyard doors, you guys now probably have seen that we have courtyards uh, doors on Lanark, Reeves, Almont, and Riverside after since we have been doing construction. So the thing with this though, is that we need you guys to be checking those courtyards. I did place it on the, the report sheet um, every night to make sure that nobody's out there and then you're locking the door. I know we're working on a different door system, like a strike to be able to have like an auto lock on it but that still won't take away the fact that you still need to check the courtyards. We would hate for somebody to be out there and we didn't know it and then they're there all night. So this is actually a pretty serious um, concern because we don't have Rome alerts on those doors. So just make sure that you're signing that off and just so you know, signing it off indicates that you check the courtyards for any residents um, and that you've also locked the doors. This doesn't have to take effect yet for, I mean, it still should, take effect for Reed or Riverside and Almont, but their courtyard is not completed yet, but the pavement is, or the cement has been poured. And so the concrete's there, we're just gonna, um, we're waiting for landscaping. So please make sure that you're doing this. Um, you know, it's not so much a problem in the summer, but I think about winter and if somebody were to be out in that courtyard and we didn't check, and then it was 40 below zero. I mean, it's just, it sounds terrible. So that's the kind of stuff we really wanna prevent with this. The med safe. So our med destruction has changed. We have a med safe located on Valley Transitions um, in their med room. All medications can go in there except for Part A meds that cannot be re or that can be returned. Uh, for non-control meds, you just take them in there and you put them in there. If your med rooms get full of medications, that is on you guys. You need to be just thinking about how can I get these out of here quickly. Uh, when a res my advice would be when a resident discharges or dies or um, has a discontinued med, you would take that right to the med safe and put them in there and be done. You'll need to find a nurse from VT to get you, um, uh, da, 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 excuse me, get you the key so that you can go into the med room and dispose of the meds. I was asked a couple of times if we could get multiple keys for the VT med room, and that's not something that I'm willing to do at this point because it gets to be too much of tracking for who has access to the room. Uh, controlled substances will still follow the process that the ADONs um, have been doing. So they'll come and get your meds and you will go with them or meet them at the med safe and you'll have the NARC books um, and then you will have the white sheets that you're currently using. You guys will co-sign those, say that you put it in the med 
safe. And then those books obviously will stay on the cart and the white sheets will be scanned in and we'll keep those for further just record keeping. Um, but the non-controlled meds, you really don't need to write those up anymore. You just put them in the med safe. Um, the thing with the med safe that you have to remember though is that you can't put anything bigger than four ounces of liquid in there. And you also can't use aerosols, which is like our um, inhalers and, and whatnot. So make sure that you're double checking that. If it's liquid, it does need to go in a little plastic baggie as well. Um, when you see or you feel like the med safe is getting full, please let me know and I can order a new liner. I can't um, place an order for a liner until I know that this one's full. We can't keep extra liners um, around. So, and once the med's in there, it's, it's in there. You're not gonna be able to get it out. So really be thinking about that. Thrifty White will now be putting an A stamp on all of the Med A meds, or excuse me, Medicare Part A meds. So if you're wondering what that little A is, that's a pink stamp, the pink stamp on there is for that. So long story short, make sure you're getting your meds to your med safe. When you're disposing of your fentanyl patches, um, like that you're taking off with one nurse, I realize it isn't ideal and I realize it's not maybe the most efficient practice, but you and that nurse will have to walk to the med safe across the building and dispose of it. Unfortunately, I know that sounds like <laughs> a lot of work, but you will need to do that um, going forward. Uh, Thrifty White has a refill form now that they are going to be using to fax us when they cannot refill a medication. This form will say, you know, whether it's too soon for insurance, if it's payment, if it's pre-authorization issues, etc. So make sure you're using that. If you get this form from Thrifty White and they say that they're not able to do that, or fill this medication, you need to think outside of the box and contact the provider, say, hey, I can't get this med, is there an alternative we could use, or we have this in our e-kit, or yada, yada, yada. We need to be doing that. Another thing we need to really work on is to make sure that we are looking at the pharmacy that the resident is um, uses if they're off of med A. We've had an issue lately where we're not notifying our pharmacies of a change in payment status. So we are, um, going to be expecting that you guys will look at the face sheet or this on the computer or in their chart and making sure you're ordering from the correct pharmacy. Um, we've had a lot of issues with insurance and then we end up paying for that, which is just not something that we need to do. But as nurses, when you guys are faxing orders or because, you know, if they're on Medi, obviously they're thrifty and it's in the computer. When they come off of Medicare A, it does not mean that they're going to stay with thrifty. Some do, but some go to walls or whatnot. So Please make sure you guys are taking a peek at that while you're um, looking at getting different uh, medications. Or so meds not available. This has come up a couple of times at different meetings. And so I wanted to put this in here as a reminder that if a med is not available, you have to troubleshoot the reason and come up with a different plan for that resident. So it's not an acceptable answer on a MAR without a progress note stating what you did to try and resolve the issue. So when, some of the things that I think of are, you know, we couldn't get this lidocaine test. Okay, so that needs to be in there that you contacted the provider or the pharmacy, you know, look at any alternatives we can do and then also look at the e-kit. A couple of um, questions or things that came up were, well, what about when we're waiting on family to bring in medications? And I would just either get them put on hold or discontinue them then it doesn't red flag basically for a surveyor that we aren't meeting this resident's need by not um, get, giving them their medications. So I would look to some of these alternatives and ideas. Also just look at what we have in our e-kit. I think our e-kit at times is really underutilized um, and it could be utilized in a, a lot more, but sometimes we'll, ha but we'll have to get creative and we'll have to actually say, you know, okay, this is what we have available to the provider. One other thing that's come up too, which has been a little bit scary, is that we've got people signing off meds that they gave them, but yet they're still in the card and they weren't administered. So what this tells me is that we are not doing a really good job of signing off our meds after we administer them. It looks to me that we're signing them off on our way to the room. And I hate to say this, but we're not psychic. We can't tell if a person is gonna take their pills or not. So don't put that pressure on yourself. You know, move your med carts, get get um, a more efficient flow going so you're not feeling like you have to sign it off prior. This really can be viewed as falsification of documentation too, which is like 
you know, that's a serious thing. It can be a potential report to the Board of Nursing, litigation, loss of your licensure. There's felony charges for it. Um, there's all sorts of articles regarding this. So take a look online. If you get a chance, just Google some of these things, and I guarantee you it will scare you a lot. So um, one of the examples that I did see was somebody checking that they or said that they were rounding on a resident every hour. And that resident was found dead in the morning and had they were able to see like how long he had been deceased. And they actually charged the C or charged that nurse with negligence. And I can't think of the other charge, but anyway, she had a hefty fine and actually got a felony conviction. So because she documented, she checked on him and they were able to prove she did not. So scary stuff. Um, medication variances. So two feedings are considered med errors. We had a situation on one neighborhood where twice in one week, a resident got the wrong tube feeding. So we realized that there's a process breakdown here and we needed to come up with something new. So beginning on August 1st, Sue, who normally brings your formula and supplies out, will continue to do that. But prior to Sue leaving the neighborhood, you will double check with her and sign off on a sticker that you've both, that you've checked this and this is correct. Um, once you have verified it's correct, you will take labels for, from the chart and put them on every bottle of formula, a can, whichever bag in that box, and then Sue will continue to check with you. Um, so the reason we're do there is a checklist that will go on the outside of the box as well. Um, you know, you're signing off your MAR that you're giving the correct tube feeding, but you're not. And so you need to make sure that we're looking at that just as much. It's not Sue's responsibility to make sure she's bringing out the right stuff. She's not a nurse. It's our job to make sure that we have the right supplies. This kind of goes into um, catheter supplies as well. It's not Sue's job. You know, if she brings out what she's told to bring out, but then the order changes or then it's a, you realize she brought the wrong one, you need to fix that. You need to change that. As nurses, that is our responsibility. So be on the lookout for this new process. It's going to be starting um, next week. Meds on pass. So when a resident goes out on a leave, all meds must be packaged up, MAR or instructions have to be sent with, and you should have a note in there in the chart displaying that the family has agreed to taking the responsibility and understands as well. But also remember that we cannot package up meds for longer than 72 hours. Um, that gets us into this whole dispensing thing and we are not able to do that. So if they're going to be gone longer than three days, I would have the pharmacy, let the pharmacy know and they can dispense the meds. Another thing um, that came up throughout the meetings uh, this week were, well, if they, what if we don't trust the person they're leaving with with the meds? Well, then think about it. Let's let's think outside of the box and let's go this way. You know what? I'll call the provider and could we do a day pass? I'll see if we can get the meds scheduled before they leave and get the rest of the meds scheduled before or after they get back. You know, nothing is so set in stone. We need to be contacting the provider. The other thing um, that came up too was to use the discharge guidelines. So you can use the discharge guidelines, which is what we, it's the carbon copy form that we use on any discharge. You can use that to fill in what's needed and the medications and have the family sign, you sign, they get a copy, we get a copy, it goes in the chart. And you know what, we've got some proof that we've given them this information. A lot of times now we just send out a a uh, little envelope of medications and say, just take these at two or whichever time. The other thing too for insulin when residents are leaving, you need to make sure that um, we are having residents go with an insulin pen. Um, we need to make sure that they're going with the pen, not an insulin syringe or a vial um, and making sure that we've taught them how to use it. The other thing too, when we have residents leaving to go home, and then they need teaching on a tube feeding or, or whatnot, if that's the case, that's our responsibility as well. The dietitian can help, but it's not the dietitian's responsibility to teach the patient how to do a tube feeding. That's our job. So just going forward, please uh, think about that as you guys are teaching people to um, do complete skills prior to discharge. Comms assessments. This is the fun topic, but beginning August 1st, so another thing that's going to start on Thursday of next week, um, Thursday, August 1st, all residents on the long-term care side will have a weekly comms assessment. So I don't care how the neighborhoods schedule it, honestly, however you guys feel it's going to work best, but every week, every resident needs a comms assessment. 
So the reason for this is because we need to have thorough documentation to give an accurate portrayal of the current condition that resident is in. But again, I don't want to tell you exactly how to do it and what's going to work best on your neighborhood versus this neighborhood. You guys can figure that all out as long as they're getting done. We'll audit that to make sure it's happening and then go from there. But again, mindset is everything. Um, when it comes to this change, don't view it as extra work, but maybe flip the script a little bit and say, you know what, wow, I'm able to actually have all of these tools right at my fingertips to be able to do an assessment that could lead to the prevention of adverse events or um, just identification. You could even lead to the identification of a, a new disease process that maybe we weren't aware of or, or whatnot. So please embrace this change because this one's going to be, this is going to be a little tough for everyone. But if you think about it, if you did you know, two comms assessments for the day shift, two comms assessments for the PM shift. I mean, that's four per day. You know, you could have all of them done within a week, roughly. So think about that. Um, the other thing, too, is this is not solely a charge nurse responsibility. If it is, if you're a treatment nurse on a cart and you have this on your TAR, then you will do a comms. If you don't know how to do a comms, you need to reach out to your other nurses and you need to have them teach you. Um, this is not an optional thing. It's not, like I said, it's not for every charge nurse and it's not just for the day shift. You know, if a comms doesn't get done on a day shift, then the PM shift needs to do the comms. Or if the PM shift doesn't get a comms done, then the night shift needs to do a comms. So don't view this as like it just has to be the day shift and it just has to be a shift. It can be everybody. Call lights. So call lights need to be within reach. Um, we are looking into revising our falls investigation worksheet again because there's some goofy questions. Um, we asked the one that says, well, it's a call light and reach prior to the fall. Well, it's not like you always know that. You would safely assume it was, but at the same time, how do you know? So we want to add a, you know, revise that question in a way to say, you know, was the call light within reach? And if it says, if you say no, well, then why? You know, we're looking at why this fall occurred when we investigate. So we need to make sure that we're um, thoroughly looking at the whole picture and trying to get all of the information. So it could be as simple as, you know, resident was in the middle of the room on the floor, obviously had self-transferred from the bed, vice, or, you know, whichever. So their call light maybe wouldn't be within reach and that would be okay. Skin and wound documentation. So make sure um, you're checking your skin and wound dashboard and also that you're following the guidelines. We're measuring and or we're um, tracking a lot of things that we actually don't need to track. So looking at um, all skin and, um, you know, wounds, bruises, all of those, they have to be greater than two by two. All of any or any pressure injury needs to be um, documented in or needs to be tracked or a picture taken of that. A good question that came out of some of the meetings were or was that should we take a picture every time we're doing an assessment if, if they're on a multiple um, per bi-weekly assessment or a couple of times a week and yes you should because that's going to give us an even better picture as we look through the progression of the wound but also remember if the wound is not showing any signs of healing or improvement within two to three weeks of a treatment or uh, dressing being ordered, then we need to have a provider look at it and maybe trial a different dressing. Like Heidi can do that or, you know, Henderson, but reach out to Heidi first if you're questioning if something should be done. Also, as a friendly reminder, two nurses need to stage a pressure injury, one of them being an RN. If it's you at two LPNs on a neighborhood and you realize you don't have an RN, then you need to call around to another neighborhood and get somebody to come over and help you. So please make sure you're doing that. And then also going in and resolving things on your dashboard that are no longer active. So we need to get better at that and work on improving that process. Stock meds. So before ordering stock meds specific to residents, so, so when it comes specifically from the pharmacy, make sure that you're checking the supply room or the stock medication list to see if we have an equivalent. Something that we've been ordering a lot of lately is like an, it's, it's Selsun Blue anti-dandruff shampoo. shampoo. And we actually have that. Uh, we have a generic version of that in our uh, stock supply room in the back. But what happens is, is if these residents are on Medicaid, you order this Selsun Blue, they get charged 7 or $8. They get $50, $65 a month. And then they're expected to pay for that. Well, then we end up paying, we end up paying for it. 
just like Lubriderm lotion, etc. So make sure that you guys are looking in the back. If you're not familiar with what we have back there, go take a look back there one day. Just go back, scope it out, see what you you know can see. Because a lot of times you'll be like, oh, I think we have that in the back. So um, make sure. Also, too, for stock meds, please do not overstock your med rooms. Um, we've had a lot of meds going into the garbage because we've overstocked the med room. Um, so and that means they expire. So Marlis, who orders on nights for Lanark, will constantly order because the stock cupboard looks empty, but yet a lot of them are being hoarded on the neighborhoods. So make sure you guys are looking through those and that you're um, not stockpiling your medications. You will have to take a couple of walks to the back and that's okay. You know, consider it getting your steps in for the day. Um, but I don't want them being kind of hoarded in that other area of the med rooms because it just takes up uh, space. And if we're not using it frequently enough and then we're ending up um, destroying them, well, doesn't do us a lot of good to do that. Gate belts. So as a reminder, gate belts aren't optional. These are these are part of your um, part of the uniform. The one thing we've been we found recently is we had a resident who was receiving a bath, was in the tub chair, stood up, did and lost her balance, fell back and hit her head. She didn't have a gate belt on. So then we started thinking, how are we transferring people in a shower if they wanted to stand up and clean off, you know, rinse off, wash themselves, because we have a lot of people who are a system one on, especially on valley transitions. And so as we did some further investigating, we realized that they are not using the gate belt for um, transfers, like if they wanted to stand up in the room, in the shower, and, you know, they're a system one. So I have actually got some on order, but like a couple of trials for a soft plastic belt that we can keep in the rooms of those residents who are a system one. Um, to make sure that we aren't allowing them to stand without a gate belt. We need to be making sure that we're doing that. And as, as nurses, please just kind of touch base with your staff, maybe remind them of this to make sure that they understand that the gate belt needs to be worn. We, um, we are not going to put them in every resident room just because of the fact that like on VT, because they all have showers, we're just going to do about 15 of them. And that's typically the number of assistive ones they have. And the reason we're doing that is because I don't want people to think that this total lift transfer, this person who's a total lift, can now use a um, gate belt when they're transferring. So we want to avoid those kinds of avoidable um, issues. So when you have equipment that's either you know missing, so you can't find a cushion or whatnot, or it's malfunctioning, make sure that you're doing the following. So you need to replace the equipment, do that. If it's malfunctioning, put it in the back hallway with a maintenance slip. Do not throw it away, whatever the equipment is. Make sure we need, like if it's a shower chair or wheelchair or something, make sure you put it in the back hallway because then we can look at it and see really what is it that caused this um, malfunction. We had a recent issue on VT or a situation where a resident fell out of the shower chair because the leg broke on the shower chair. So. That's why we need to look at that and figure out like the integrity of the product. And is it a warranty thing? Is it a, you know, just a whole bunch of things. So fill that out, uh, fill out the maintenance slip and put it in the back. If you can't find equipment, be proactive and go and look for some. So if it's after hours, you know, look in the storage room in the back, look in both therapy rooms, look in the storage rooms on the neighborhoods. Um, don't wait for Jane to come in the next day or Monday to replace a cushion or whatnot. Go into the therapy rooms and try and find that stuff. If you can't find it, then leave Jane a message at 7560 so that you're able to um, have her look into it and find you a replacement. Real-time charting. This is a fun topic that we're just starting. Um, I'm going to try and pull up something here to show you. But So real-time charting is what's supposed to be happening with our CNAs. The thing that's not happening, though, is real-time charting. So... Think about a turning and repositioning schedule. So if you have it set for every two hours, the expectation that there would be a documentation timestamp for every two hours that you repositioned it. But what we're finding is that repositioning is all signed off at the same time. So you may have gone in there at 8 a.m., 10 a.m., 12 p.m., 2 p.m. to turn them, but yet you've only charted four times at 1.52 p.m. This is a really big challenge when we're trying to investigate. So we need to make sure that we're actually encouraging this real-time charting. You can view it on your dashboards, and that's actually what I'm going to try and show you here. I'll bring it up here. 
So here is your dashboard. This is my dashboard. I see a lot more probably than you guys, but so when you scroll down, um, let's see here. You scroll down and you can see um, the tasks. So we need to, okay, this is just kind of a funny thing, but I did see this in a, I was doing some audits the other day and I saw that we had aspirin 81 milligrams and that we're checking a pain level for it. It actually made me laugh because obviously it's not for pain. Um, but the other part of this that actually is a bit frustrating is that the template is set up that way, but you have to take that off of there when you're putting the order in. So this order, we've been checking this lady's pain. This, I think it was, yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, checking her pain for the last probably two months. Thank God it was only at a one, which is good. Um, but we need to, you guys need to take initiative with that. You need to be saying, okay, this seems silly that I have to check a pain level for that and get rid of it. Don't just let it go on because you don't want to be the one to change it. So make sure you're doing that. Um, neighborhood emails. This is your responsibility to check. So I have in here every nurse, including full-time, part-time, and flex. So that's everybody. And you know what? If you don't know how to access it, you need to ask for some help. There's so much important information that goes through on email that you guys should be checking and looking at. Make sure that if you, because all the med cards have emails or have computers, and you can access that through the O-Drive, and we can show you how to do that. So if you don't know, make sure to ask, but also make sure you're checking on it or checking the email. I don't prefer to sit in meetings and hear, well, the nurses said they didn't know this. Well, if it's been communicated out, there's, there comes a point where this has to become your responsibility. So please work on checking those, those emails. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about professionalism and supervision. So professionalism isn't an option for you guys in our practice. Our careers, we are um, licensed nurses. We have a professional standards to uphold. We have a Nurse Practice Act to uphold. Um, you know, I've heard recently that we've had people yelling at each other. Why? 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 We are all adults and it's not okay to be yelling at people. Um, it's not okay to not have a conversation if there's something wrong. We need to communicate. I've heard a few different things recently that have been a little bit concerning. Um, you know, staff yelling at each other, like I said, that's, that's not okay. CNAs yelling at each other. You guys as leaders need to be able to handle those difficult situations. And I guarantee you, nine times out of ten, communication is the only issue, that's the only thing that's missing. And you know what? Keeping an open mind as well. You guys have so much power amongst all of you to be able to handle these situations. And you know what? There are going to be times that you're going to hurt somebody's feelings. But if your motives are right and you've got the right idea going forward, then you know what? That's on them. That's not on you. And we need to be able to realize that we can't be saying some of the things we're saying at the med carts. You know, we can't be, like I said, up front at the coffee shop and, you know, talking about how terrible everything is. Um, I walked up to the meeting yesterday and I had, a, I saw a CNA and two nurses and what they were doing, the CNA was doing was talking so loud about the fact that they were short staffed and this and that, and the two nurses didn't do anything. So I walked up and I said, this isn't a, an appropriate place to, you know, like I said, come into the meeting here, it's not an appropriate place to have the, that conversation. And you know what, is it mean? No, it's being, uh, it's being honest. It's saying this is not appropriate. And as nurses, though, I expect you to say to her, well, you know, that's that's unfortunate, but I bet it was still a really good day. You know, it's all in our perception. Another thing that happened over the weekend, um, I was administration on call and I did get a call from a nurse that asked if we had to take a resident back because she was, um, it was just her, she's an LPN and there was just another LPN. And then she wanted to take this resident, the hospital called and said they wanted to take her back. And she said, well, can we wait till tomorrow when there's an RN here. And I said, well, no, we have 24 hours to take a resident back. If we don't, excuse me, feel that they're medically stable, then yes, we can, we can push off the move, the return. But if it doesn't have anything to do with them and it's kind of at our convenience, we, we can't keep somebody in the hospital for an extra night. That just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't make sense. So again, just make sure that you guys are looking at that. Um, one other thing I did get called for here or called over the weekend was a vancomycin issue on a neighborhood. 
And it's really unfortunate because the vancomycin order had been wrong for 10 days and it was being administered and no one thought, no one figured it out. So that's scary to me because it also tells me that we're maybe not doing all of our F5, 6 rights. So continue to work on doing that, making sure you're giving the correct medications and the correct dose. The label and the computer must match. Um, and then also too, utilizing your in-house resources before calling the nurse manager on call. Like I said earlier, you guys have so much power together and you guys have so many ideas and suggestions and solutions. And you know what? Reach out, lean on each other. If you have a question on something, either somebody else is going to be able to teach you or you know what? Maybe you both don't know and then we can, everybody can be educated on that. So again, communication is key. Attitude. This is pretty close to the last slide here, but um, I just wanted to say how many of you have said, I had a horrible day. Or this day was so bad, I can't even. But think about it. Our attitudes are in our control. So if we choose to not have a good day, we're not going to have a good day. We had a situation where I had um, two nurses yelling at each other or being upset with each other. And that one half an hour ruined their whole entire day. That's 148th of your entire 24 hours. Don't go to that dark place. Let yourself like be happy, be positive, you know, um, I was also told the other day that they felt like the building was really, it was really tense around the building. And I said, no, I don't, I don't think so. But then I realized too, the reason it's not, I don't feel it's tense is because I don't pay attention to the tense. Yes, I pay attention to those good, positive vibes. I come to work every day with a smile on my face and I am happy while I'm here. That is what I want you guys to do. I don't want bad attitudes because you know what? Bad attitudes are no good. And unfortunately, misery loves company. So then more people join that bandwagon. So remember that your attitude is your choice. Remember that you're a role model, you're professionals, you're setting examples for your CNAs. And think about that as you are going to carry on your day and, you know, and determine whether or not you're going to be upset about it or you're going to be happy about it. So uh, ACE meetings are coming up. So make sure that you are signed up for those. Otherwise, um, keep me posted. If